The epistle reading for today is taken from James 5, 13 to 20, prayer offered in faith. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bushwalking can be a lot of fun. You get to see amazing things, you get to challenge yourself, have a sense of achievement. It can be at your own pace and your own setting. It can be hard work or it can simply be relaxing. But if you're into serious bushwalking, whether of the hard work or the relaxing kind, sooner or later, most people find that there are advantages to walking in a group. In a group, you have other people to encourage you when the going is hard. Even people to lend a hand in carrying some of the stuff you need to carry and in lifting you over the hardest parts. In a group, you have people to share the joys with, who are able to reminisce with you about the vistas that you've just seen and spur you on to the next hill to see the new ones. In a group, there's someone with whom you face dangers, someone where who there for you to help if you have an accident, and people to help you choose the right path and help you get back on the right path if you do happen to go astray. And all of that, of course, is a pretty good picture of the Christian life. In our reading today, James gives us a picture of both what it is to live as an individual Christian in personal relationship with God, but also what it is to live in a community of Christians who are in relationship with God. God does relate to us as individuals, but he also relates to us as part of the people of God. Indeed, God relates to us sometimes through the people of God. And just as he uses each one of us individually to achieve his will and purpose in the world, so he uses the others to achieve his will and purpose in us. He gives us to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ for the journey. As the reading from James today begins, we see that God intends that we should be relating to him in all the circumstances of life. Our relationship with God is not just a Sunday morning relationship, but God is involved in our lives in far more closely than our family or our, even our housemates ever did. And so God, through James, calls us to recognise his presence in all our circumstances. If you are in trouble, bring that to God because he cares. Come to him with your heart's desires and your need. 1 Peter 5, 7 says... Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But God's not just there in the difficult times of life, he's also there in the good times. And so James also tells us that if we are cheerful, then we should praise God. 
That is, simply to recognise that God is the giver of all good gifts, as James said in chapter 1, and that the things that give us pleasure are, in fact, signs of God's gift to us. So whether we weep or whether we laugh, God invites us to remember consciously that he is a participant in our lives and invites us to lean on him in every circumstance. I think it's fair to say that James probably doesn't only have personal prayer and private prayer in mind. Of course, a, a habit of private prayer is wonderful, and we ought to offer our prayers in our need and our praise and our joy in our privacy of our own homes and bedrooms. But I rather suspect here that when James encourages his, his people to pray and to praise, what he means is to pray and to praise in the presence of others. You see, today when we use the word Prayer, we most naturally think of it as prayer in private, but that assumption wasn't actually the assumption strong in biblical times. For them, the primary meaning of prayer really was the prayer that is done together in a group and in the presence of other people. In any case, when the Apostle Paul says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, he surely clearly assumes that we are sharing our points of rejoicing and mourning with one another. Of course it's good to pray and praise alone, but it's also very good to do it in the company of others. And that becomes clearer then as James goes on in the text. God is not only interested in those parts of our lives that are our external troubles and joys, the things that are happening to us, God is also interested in the things that are happening in us. God is concerned for our well-being in every way and wants to be involved with us in whatever illness or weakness we have, whether of body or soul. The Bible takes a more holistic view of what real wellness is than our society often does. To have true peace is not just to have an absence of conflict or a good social situation or to be economically well off, it's also to be healthy. And health is understood as including those things that today we would call the emotional, the psychological, spiritual, and even moral aspects of life, as well as the physical. To be healthy and to have well-being in the biblical term includes all those things. And I want to be really clear that in the passage, James doesn't draw a direct line between sin and physical illness. But what he does is he recognises that we are whole people. And that these things are not so easily disentangled as sometimes we might think. God is interested in us, body and soul. Every word that James uses can refer to physical illness and physical healing. But every word that he uses here for those things also had wider, more metaphorical meanings that would extend to what we would call the psychological and moral aspects of life. They could even extend so far as the idea of salvation in its fullest sense. So the word that we translate as ill, actually maybe more directly would be translated as weak, and it can mean morally weak or spiritually weak. The word that's translated healed, more often than not in the New Testament, is translated as saved in the religious sense. And of course the word that's translated as be raised up, you know, God will raise them up, is, uh, can refer to waking a person out of sleep, it can refer to healing them from illness, and it can refer, that's the word that we used when we say that Christ was raised from the dead. So it can refer to resurrecting someone from the dead. Thus God wants to deal with our sickness and our sin. In fact, we can hardly ignore the Gospel reading today in which Jesus gives us a dramatic verbal picture that suggests that our spiritual health is actually far more important than our physical well-being. We are to seek holistic health together. James doesn't just say that the sick person is to pray, but that they are to summon the elders to come and pray for them. If the Christian can't come to the church to express their need for prayer, then the church will come to them. God does not only want us to be involved directly with him, but he wants us to be involved with him through other people and with other people. 
Thus the whole body of God's people are called on to be involved in trusting prayer for the well-being of its members in body and soul. When one walker on the path twists an ankle or breaks a leg, the, the whole group then chips in to look after them or even to carry them to a place of safety. James tells us together to trust our Heavenly Father and in his ability to heal and restore us. Now I do have to comment that God does heal physical ailments, but he doesn't always heal physical ailments, and we don't have that promise. But the promise of the gospel is that our sin, which is our greatest illness and the one that leads to death, is always healed and forgiven for the sake of Christ. So just as the walkers on the trail help each other as they go, James tells us to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that together we can experience God's deliverance. And again, sometimes people get concerned in this passage by the saying that the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. They look at themselves or they look around at others and then go, well, there, there's no hope for me. They start to be down on themselves because they don't think they're righteous or maybe they conclude that because they weren't healed, that means that they're not righteous and God has rejected them. But remember that the point when James quotes the story about Elijah is not that Elijah was somehow wonderfully better than everybody else. James tells us what the point is. The point, he says, is that Elijah was a human being just like us. And remember that what he says is we are to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other that we may be healed. And therefore, the very people who are called on to do the praying are people who are also called on to do the confessing. The truly righteous person, therefore, is the person who puts their trust in God's mercy because of the merit of Christ. Thus, in the community of faith, we are always sinners and forgiven saints who are righteous for the sake of Christ. Righteousness, it turns out, is not the same as perfection. And finally, we need to remember in the end that it wasn't the personal character of Elijah that withheld or gave the rain, but the fact that he was praying according to God's direction and trusting in what God had told him. Finally, James reminds us then of our duty to help each other stay in the truth. By stay in the truth, he doesn't just mean to believe the right things, although he clearly includes that, but actually to live lives that are shaped by the truth of God's promises and commands. And he reminds us that a, a loving correction that brings somebody back from sin is a correction that saves them from death. It's all too easy for us to walk into sin and then to have sin lead us further and further from the path until we've lost our faith. But God gives us to each other so that just like the walkers on the path, we are supposed to help people find the right way and bring them back when they've made a mistake. The forgiveness that God offers and proclaims in this chosen community is a forgiveness that is free and full. To help someone come back from sin, he says, is to cover a multitude of sins. The restoration of God's forgiveness is always complete. No matter how badly we or our walking companions have gone off the path, when someone brings us back to God's forgiveness, we are once again set amongst his people and in the presence of God. The thief on the cross with Jesus discovered that after a lifetime of saying no to God, Jesus could still promise him in that one moment, today you will be with me in paradise. And so dear people of God, today God invites us to recognise his presence with us and to include him consciously in our lives, in prayer and praise. He also calls us to share our prayer and praise, our joys and sorrows with each other, and to join with each other in the ups and downs of life. He gives us to each other, so that we can intercede for each other, so that God's power for the well-being of body and soul might be realised in our lives, that our sins may be forgiven, and that we may be healed and saved. 
But again, I think it would be true to say that James would want to remind us that it's not just by knowing these truths, but by living them out, by actually sharing with one another that we will experience the fullness of joy that it brings. God has given you the amazing gift of blessing of the people with whom to share the journey. In doing so, every suffering will be halved, every joy will be doubled, and together we will know God's presence and peace. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds together in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.